glad to have you here for the third part of the lecture on aspect-oriented programming. So in the third part of the lecture, we will again talk about cross-cutting concerns, how to modularize cross-cutting concerns. We looked at limitations of existing techniques, uh, implementation techniques that we discussed in the last lectures that provide modularity, but not for cross-cutting concerns. We looked at feature-oriented programming as a rather simple language extension, and we will see that aspect orientation is rather the heavyweight extension to enable cross-cutting concerns, but at the same time provides more means to modularize cross-cutting concerns that are unplanned previously. So again, uh, we have cross-cutting concerns in our systems. Due to the tyranny of the dominant decomposition, we will always have a dominant decomposition. So we decompose our system in a certain design. And then there will be something that is cross-cutting to this modular structure. So we've seen this for arithmetic expressions. And why is this a problem? One thing is that of making changes local. We don't want to look into all the implementation, but also when it comes to feature traceability, we want to debug something. We want to see the code that is um, uh, implemented for a certain feature. So we want to find features not only in products, but also in the whole product line implementation. Again, as in the beginning of the last uh, part of the lecture on feature under programming, we want to have something that requires minimal pre-planning uh, that does also work if pre-planning is infeasible, because not all the possible future extension can be envisioned. And we want to have flexible extension. We want to have mix and match the different features. So we look at aspects now, at aspect-oriented programming. So what is an aspect? An aspect encapsulates the implementation of a cross-cutting concern. So an aspect is is basically, uh, it's another word for a feature module, but we will see in a minute why we need another term for this, why an aspect is not the same as a collaboration or a layer or a feature module. An aspect encapsulation uh, encapsulates the implementation of cross-cutting concerns in one module. Then we have this aspect weaving, and we can see this graphically over here. We have a base program, and this base program uh, provides some components, some classes, some implementation. And then we can uh, decide to make some extensions to this program. And then we can define different aspects. For instance, we have aspect A over here. We have aspect B. Then we can make a choice on the aspects that we need for our system. And then a so-called aspect weaver uh, will produce the, uh, the woven program, the resulting program in which the uh, base program is enriched by means of certain aspects, by means of certain uh, additional implementations and extensions. So the aspect weaver merges the separate aspects of a program and the base program at user selected program locations. So localizing a cross cutting concern within one code unit um, eliminates the code scattering and tangling. We discussed this for preprocessors, for runtime variability already, but we also have this for clone and own, um, the scattering and tangling. And this is reduced because we can now encapsulate, we can now write everything that is uh, according to our feature or aspect into one module that is called aspect. And aspect can affect multiple other concerns uh, with one piece of code and thereby avoiding code replication. And this is one, one of the advantages uh, in terms of feature-oriented programming, that whenever you want to apply the same code to different locations, this is actually something that is much better supported with aspects uh, than with feature modules. In this lecture, we will talk about aspect J. Aspect J is an aspect-oriented language extension of Java. Uh, so we have the base program, which is written in Java, and the different components here in this picture are basically classes and packages in Java. And the aspects are written in Java, but typically include, include a multitude of new language constructs. So for instance, we will see that there's a different 
keyword. We will not write class, but we will want to write aspect. And this indicates that this is a special kind of class and it has some new language constructs. And then we have the aspect weaver, which in terms of aspectj is the aspectj compiler. And it follows a compile time binding approach. And still certain decisions are made at runtime. So this means the aspect weaver will combine the aspects into the code, but there are some positions where statically it cannot be decided whether the new code should be executed at that position. And then this will be made available and runtime variability will be generated. SPJ is the most popular and widely used aspect-oriented language. Uh, all examples in this lecture will be given in SPJ uh, for this reason, uh, but it was also the, not only the most popular language, but this uh, goes hand in hand with the best tool support being available, at least until um, yeah, the tool support, even for SPJ, was uh, uh, stopped or the development of tool support was stopped um, for Eclipse. We can have static extensions uh, of existing source code. And this, in the aspect-oriented world, is known as intertype, intertype declaration. An intertype declaration injects a method, field, or interface from inside an aspect into an existing class or interface. So in the example, so the typical use case is I want to add a new field to an existing class, or I want to introduce a new method to an existing class. And in our example of graphs, uh, the edges, they might have weights or the set weight method, but they only have this if the feature weighted is uh, selected and is made available. And we already see that this is not, it looks like Java, but there are uh, subtle differences already here. Uh, so we do not write class, but rather aspect here to indicate this is a special kind of class. And in this class, we can use new language constructs. And in particular, uh, this uh, edge prefix here indicates that we want to add these fields and methods, these members to the existing class edge. But only adding uh, static extensions in terms of, the, of these intertype declarations is typically not enough. We've seen this already in the feature-oriented uh, world in the last part of the, uh, the lecture that <clears throat> we sometimes also want to override existing methods. And the interesting point about aspectj is that there are many positions in the control flow where we can insert and add some new code while in feature under programming, the only thing that is made possible is that we can override existing methods, but it's much more complicated over here because the overall goal is that I can apply any change from an aspect to an existing program without any pre-planning involved, without anything that needs to be manipulated in the base program. So we will come to the notion of a join point, a join point is an event in the execution of a program at which aspects can be woven into the program. So any point in execution that we can have, we can uh, add some additional code uh, there. And we'll also see that sometimes we can replace existing code. So the code that is being executed at a join point, when the join point matches, when the join point occurs during execution, is called advice which is a bit hard when talking about this topic, because if we have several of such code snippets, then we will talk about pieces of advice. Uh, join points in SPECJ, there are multiple join points available. And uh, we will not be exclusive. Uh, we will not talk about all the possible join points in this lecture, but rather some examples. We can call or execute a method or a constructor. We can access the field and read or write access. We can catch an exception. Uh, we can execute an advice. So we can even um, have join points whenever aspect code is executed. And then also other aspects, aspects can work with this join point. But to make this a bit more concrete, we have an example here. So we have a main method in the math util and in, in the test class. And 
the mass utic class. So we have two classes over here and the main method is executed. And once it is executed, we have a field access to the variable uh, mass util uh, of type mass util u over here. We have, um, and that's uh, uh, an access to the variable to the field in which we set the value, but we also have um, a get value because once we um, yeah, access the value, then it's we, we read it. Uh, so we have a read and write access to fields. Uh, we have the execution of a method, but also the call of a method over here. Um, so once the, the twice method, but also, uh, also the print method. And it's, it's a bit tricky to see this uh, when starting this aspect on the programming, but there's actually a difference between calling and executing a method. If you call a method, then you will be over here. And if you execute it, then you will be over here. And of course, this has something to do with the state of the program. What kind of variables can you access? Will you be able to access the variable i? Will you be able to access the internal state of mass util? So whenever you need the internal state of the callee of the uh, object on which the method is executed, then you will use method execution and method call whenever it's sufficient to be on the caller side uh, of the method. So these are different join points. And now the question is, once we define those join points, the question is, how do we specify where to put pieces out of advice at which of those join points that happen during execution? And what we will use for this is something that is called point cuts. And these point cuts basically make a selection. I can say, I want to access every, I want to, uh, extend something whenever a field is accessed, independent whether it's set or jet, uh, get. I want to uh, uh, find out whenever a method is called, uh, whenever any method is called, then this could be a point cut um, that is relevant here. And the question is how to define those point cuts, and this is probably the most um, the most complicated part of aspect on the program was aspect J because we need to define those um, those uh, join points. We need to define predicates, and those predicates are called point cuts. A point cut is a declarative specification of the join points that an aspect aspect affects. It is a predicate that determines whether a given join point matches this predicate. We will see in a minute that there's also quantification. I already mentioned one example. We want to find all the field accesses independent of whether it's read or write. And this is a kind of quantification. Then we will go over all the possible, um, quantify over all the possible join points, whether it's read or write. But there's even, if I'm only talking about read accesses, there might be different locations in the program. There might be different occurrences during the execution, even if there's only a single statement in the source code. So I can execute advice X whenever the method set weight of class H is called, or I can execute advice Y whenever any field in class H is accessed, or I can execute advice Z whenever a public method is called anywhere in the system and the method initialized has, and the method initialized has been called beforehand. So you see, this is much more complicated than what we can do with feature on the programming. With feature on the program, we can only, uh, yeah, uh, find out if a method is called and the behavior of the method is changed. But over here, it's much more complicated. The standard way of doing this, uh, of writing point cuts and aspects, is the following. So we have an aspect A1 over here, and we have the advice code, which is written over here. And then we have the point cut, which is basically this predicate uh, specifying when this piece of advice is executed at runtime. In this example, uh, we would listen to all twice methods uh, whenever they are executed. Um, and those twice methods are defined in mass util. We don't specify the package. so. Uh, 
if we have multiple mass util classes in different packages with the trice method, then they would be called, but only if they have an integer as a parameter and an integer as the return type. Then we have the after uh, keyword, which, which I will come to in a minute. Uh, but let us first look at explicit and anonymous point cuts. So this is fine if you only specify this predicate once and you only have this one piece of code, one piece of advice that is inserted. But sometimes you might want to have different pieces of advice uh, code that uh, is added somewhere and you might want to reuse existing predicates. We will see later on that predicates can get quite complicated and that's why we can use the point cut keyword to define an explicit point cut uh, which can later on be used at different positions and that's kind of the definition of the point cut over here. So we can quantify over other join points. For instance, uh, we have an example here where we listen to the call of a method. And because we listen to the call and not the execution, we will find this over here in the program. And actually, we will listen to these two statements over here because both, both are um, calls of the method twice. When it comes to constructors, uh, there's a very similar, um, uh, a very similar um, way of doing this. Uh, if we call a constructor, there's no need to provide its return type, right? So that's why this is empty here. Um, we uh, can provide uh, the parameters, of course. Uh, in this case, it's just a default constructor, so there are no. Um, no new, um, yeah, we don't have parameters over here and we don't have even defined a constructor over here. And we use a special keyword that cannot be used uh, for names of classes anyway. It's a keyword new. And the keyword new over here indicates that this is a constructor call of the class of mass util. And then we have many more of these um, uh, join points, of these point cuts, uh, defining predicates on those join points. Uh, we will see some, some more uh, later on. Let's first talk about quantification options. So how can I quantify? I can specify um, uh, the, the first uh, predicate over here would actually quantify over all the packages because packages have not, not been defined. But I can also quantify over all the methods independent of their return type. Uh, typically, the return type is not considered part of the signature. So it's typically uh, given in terms of the, uh, the uh, overall method anyway. So this is very common to specify just a star for the return type of method. However, in principle, we could also say, I want to listen to all methods that uh, return an integer and it's independent how their name looks like. And we will see this in a minute. Um, so uh, we can say it's independent of the parameters. So I don't care how many, um, uh, uh, which parameter, but it needs to be exactly one. It can be an arbitrary number or I want to have at least one parameter, then I would, um, then would, would write something like this. If I want to have at least one, then I would write something like this in brackets. We can also uh, quantify over all the possible classes that are available because we want to listen to all the twice methods. We want to listen to all the classes that end on util and the methods that start with two. Uh, we have other options. And for instance, here, we also want to listen to all the possible subclasses. So the concrete class, mass util, or any subclass that is instantiated. And then we can have logical connections of these point cards. We can use and, we can use not, we can use or. Uh, and sometimes we, we even need this to access certain parts like the parameters uh, or the parameter types. So how to define the advice? There are different versions. So sometimes we want to uh, insert the new code, the advice, 
before the join point, sometimes after the join point, and sometimes around that one. Uh, around is actually needed whenever it comes to method. I might want to explain uh, ex, uh, exchange the complete method implementation by a new one. We can simply do this in uh, object oriented programming in inheritance and in subclasses by means of overwriting the method and not using the super keyword. Um, in, uh, in feature oriented programming and feature models, we've seen original and super. Uh, this is actually supposed to be a large super. Um, it would be a small super in object oriented programming. And here overall, we also have a keyword, but this time it's called proceed, but it has the very same uh, meaning in terms of aspects. So whenever I call a method, I want to proceed now and call the method that the join point was for. So we have examples here. Uh, we have the before uh, uh, advice, we have the after advice, we have the around advice. And then I can also say uh, after the method returned or after the method was throwing an exception. So you see, this is quite complicated and we're not, we are not even showing uh, all the possible language constructs, but you see that even in terms of methods, it's quite complicated what are the uh, join points you, that you can listen to. Still, uh, the overall vision of aspect J was you can take any program and you can write an aspect that manipulates this program in any possible way. And as a fallback, if there's no language construct uh, available, and there are some, some rare cases where this is not the case, then you can always fall back to this join point. So this join point is a special keyword, and this keyboard, uh, keyword can be used to find out the following information. We can uh, find out uh, the method signature or the, the signature of the join point. We can find out uh, what is the type? Is, is it a method call? Is it a field um, access? Is it a read access of a field or write access? But we can also uh, access the source code location. And if there's no other way to define a join point, you can always resort to in test Java uh, statement or line number five, uh, I want to uh, apply the following join point. So you could listen to all the possible join points that are out there and then say, I'm only reacting to this uh, particular position. So this is very, um, very expressive. You can do many things with this, but of course, like looking at particular numbers of lines of code is probably not what we want from a software engineering perspective. Um, there are some other uh, details uh, on the language. Uh, I would uh, go a bit more briefly uh, on those topics. For instance, sometimes you want to access the value that was passed to, to, uh, per, uh, to an original method. So we have an execution uh, point cut over here. And we want to, in a system out print line, we want to output the value. But in order to be able to access the value, what we do is we define a parameter for our point cut. We say our parameter has the point cut, uh, the parameter value. And we say whenever, when, uh, yeah, whatever was the parameter that was passed to this method over here, we want to store this in the variable value. And then we do the same in for the actual uh, piece of advice. So we say it has a parameter uh, and the parameter is passed and initialized over here whenever this piece of advice over here is executed. So it's a bit complicated uh, when we want to access certain values. Um, so in this case, the keyword args is the central one which allows us to find, uh, to store the original parameters in certain variables and we use them in uh, our code. We have special point cuts, this and target, and they help us to specify the objects. Uh, this is the object that is, uh, uh, that is operating. So if I'm having a method call and uh, this will point to the caller of the method, and if I'm having 
uh, a method call, uh, it will actually be applied on a certain object, then this will be the target. And in some cases, we want to access both the original caller and its data and also the callee, so the called object. And we can do this by means of this and target. Um, this will store the object this in the variable s and target will store uh, the variable target uh, in the variable t. And this is again just a parameterized point cut where we say we have the main class or an object of this in the, field, uh, in the parameter s and mass utility in the parameter t. Similar to feature modules, the order matters in which we uh, uh, yeah, combine, uh, compose these aspects. There are many cases where the order does not matter. So it, there's no difference uh, depending on the order. We've already seen examples for feature on the programming. If we would use aspect on the programming for the very same example, then we would also have differences here. And there's a simple way of doing this. Every aspect can declare the aspect precedence, and the precedence is basically a partial order. So the precedence can be can specify, okay, double weight always needs to come after weight, and this needs to come after any other uh, uh, aspect that we are weaving together. So the, the interesting part is uh, it's, it's not very trivial to see, but uh, if you play around with those old uh, integrated development environments and aspect J, you can try out what happens for before advice, around advice, and after advice. It's not quite, um, uh, quite intuitive on the, on the first side how this precedence will actually be applied. To make a long story short, or, or this effort of trying it out, first all the before advices are executed, then all the around advices, and this uh, in the uh, uh, declared precedence, and then all the after advices, but also in the declared precedence. And if the concrete precedence is not defined, then the aspect J compiler will just choose any total order that respects the um, uh, the partial order defined in respective aspects. So what happens uh, beside the scenes uh, weaving aspect J on a very conceptual level? There are many details where something is, is more complicated, but intertype declarations are basically added to the respective classes. So the classes are actually manipulated before being compiled, before being compiled or while being compiled into Java bytecode. Each advice is con uh, converted into a method. Um, aspects are actually converted into classes. Point cuts at method, uh, method call from the join points to the advice. And we have some dynamic extensions where we insert source code uh, at all join points that uh, checks uh, then these dynamic conditions. And if these conditions hold, then the advice method is called. So aspect J uh, works technically like this, that you provide all your Java code, you provide all your aspects, so you can write still standard Java, you write some aspects to this, uh, you all give this to the build path and to the compiler, and the aspect J compiler will be able to translate this into, um, yeah, uh, into bytecode directly. Of course, there are other options, there are also aspect J compilers or uh, transformers that produce Java code in a similar fashion as we've seen this for feature modules, where you can inspect the output. And there's other techniques, uh, for instance, in interpreted languages, if you provide an aspect-oriented version of this, then you can use meta object protocols and uh, evaluate the aspect weaving at runtime. So what are typical, typical traditional aspects, logging, tracing, profiling? That's what we mentioned as problematic for cross-cutting concerns. For instance, if we want to record the time to execute public methods and only my public methods, then I can say, okay, only methods from within here. I don't care about the parameters and the names, but it need to be public methods. And then for those, I want to execute this method. But before and after, I would check the time and then uh, print their duration uh, together with a point 
signature and then I will know this method defined in the following um, file and the following method uh, had this, this amount of time spent in this public method. So aspects for product line, the basic idea would be to implement one aspect for every feature. And the feature selection determines which of the aspects are included into the build path, into the weaving process, which are passed to the aspect J compiler and which are not. So the aspects encapsulate the changes to be made to existing classes. However, the aspects do not encapsulate new classes introduced by a feature only uh, nested classes within uh, and aspects are feasible. So what we can see here, uh, this is uh, again an aspect and in this aspect we have some intertype declarations. Uh, so the field color will be added to node together with this initialization. Um, we will have some new static class that is added. So this is a new class that is added to the base implementation. It's a class color and then we see that this is the way to express um, that in order to, um, uh, to change the way how the print method has worked before in the base implementation, we uh, have an additional line. And as we need to access the color of the node, uh, we need to uh, store it in the variable n by means of the this keyword. And that's why we have a parametric piece of advice over here. Aspects are quite controversial, so there has been lots of discussion in the community. And it's also similar to many hypes that we've seen in software engineering in the past, is that there are many promises, many things that are positive, where people say, that's why you should do it, and that's a new way how we should implement system, and that's that will be the best system and modularized and so on. But then at some point in time, the hype uh, turns down and people realize, okay, it's, uh, there are also problems with this. So let's first come to the promises. The promise of aspect orientation was the principle of obliviousness. The base program is supposed to be oblivious with respect to the aspects that hook into the system. And this is on purpose. So the idea was that we can develop base programs and we don't need to care about aspects. Aspects will be added later on. So the base program can be developed by uh, standard developers that don't need, to need, uh, don't need to know all the details of aspect J and all those uh, special keywords. And we have some special aspect programmers that extend the base program. So while this was the, the uh, advertisement, back then and uh, many companies started to use this. There was official integrated development environment to support. People started to use Eclipse uh, implemented aspects uh, in their systems. It turned out that this had several problems. Was one of them is the fragile point cut problem. So the base program may be modified so that the set of join points changes in an undesired way. And undesired can mean can go in both directions, in two directions. Either join points may be removed accidentally. So there are join points which are removed from a point cut predicate, uh, but they were supposed to be still in there. So it could be that I'm renaming a method and afterwards it's not handled in my point cut anymore, but I still want it in the point cut, I still need it. And then my aspect will, uh, will break. And the other way can happen that join points may be captured by aspects accidentally. Uh, and we have an example for this over here. So um, imagine that we have had methods to draw different uh, chess players like king, queen, uh, and knight. So the different figures. And we, we don't want to match all of them. I don't want to mention draw king and draw queen and draw knight. And what I do in my extended point is to say all the methods that start with draw. But then we have a new method and the match, uh, the new method is called draw, which is kind of a state in chess where the, uh, the goal is uh, the, the, the chess game ends. And uh, it's uh, kind of no one uh, wins the game. It's called draw. And this has nothing to do with drawing in 
the sense of figures. So my point card is very likely to produce some wrong results after this change. So this is the problem of fragile point cut and oblivious worsens the fragile point cut problem in a way that if you really do this, that base programmers implement and don't need to know anything about aspects, then uh, it is more likely that changes break the aspect bindings and can, can remain unnoticed for a long time. So again, as for every previous implementation technique and we discussed uh, several of them, and this is the last technique that we discuss uh, in the, this product line lecture. I also want to give you some advantages and disadvantages. What are advantages of aspect on the programming? The separation of feature code into distinct uh, aspects is feasible even for cross cutting concerns. And due to this quantification, it's even possible for this the pieces of advice for changes that we want to apply to spread out to many different locations in the source code, we can even do those in a very comfortable way. We have direct feature traceability from features to implementation if we apply this one feature to one aspect uh, mapping. We have little or no pre-planning effort required because Aspect J is so uh, expressive that we can express all the possible changes. So in principle, we don't need pre-planning. But of course, it could be that the quality and the complexity of an aspect can be improved uh, if we design our system, our base application. So uh, and that's why it says little pre-planning, because sometimes it might be better to change the base application a bit to not fall back to lines of code in which you add some piece of code, some new piece of new code. We have fine-grained variability driven by the join point model of the aspect on the language. So we can make any changes to our program and we can do this in a modular fashion in a way that all the source code will then be uh, inserted in the same aspect. Of course, there are disadvantages. Uh, as for every technique, there are disadvantages. It requires the adoption of a rather complex extension mechanism. And this is the main reason why I think personally that aspect uh, J and aspect on the program, uh, yeah, at some point in time, people stopped doing this. They stopped developing tool, for, tool support for this. It was a lot of uh, energy, a lot of uh, power, human power spent into developing these tools or this tool support for aspect J for the integrated development environments. Uh, there was actually great tools uh, available uh, like 10 years ago, but now they are not maintained anymore. There's a lot of effort going into this and people stopped using aspect J. And then at some point in time, it didn't make sense anymore to develop uh, these, this tool support if it's not used anymore in practice. And in terms of uh, the comparison with feature modules or with P processors, there's there's no uh, there's nothing that can be uh, considered as a unifying theory when it comes to some artifacts of a software that are not source code. If we look at Java code and object-oriented code, then we have aspect-oriented extension of this. But how to do this for HTML for uh, some Docker scripts or, or whatever. So the unifying theory is kind of missing here. It's available for feature models because the feature module is basically a folder and you could, can plug in, you can put all your files in there. And it's also possible for preprocessors, but it's not so easily for aspects. And the program evolution and maintenance affected is affected by the fragile point cut problem. So we will have many problems in the long run. And people started using aspect J for uh, indus industrial projects. And then after a while, they found out those maintenance problems are actually much harder. And they uh, were looking for other ways to implement their variability, their aspects, uh, and also their product lines. So not all of those implementations of that have used aspect J were actually product lines. In many cases, they just wanted to change the behavior of an existing library. So they provided maybe just one aspect, but still uh, it, it's not that much used anymore in practice.
So what are the lessons learned? The principal idea is in program P, whenever condition C arises, perform action A. So this is the basic principle behind this. SPJ is a sophisticated join point model and powerful language to quantify over join points by means of point cuts. So a point cut describes all the possible join points where we add some new code and this new code added is called advice. It supports the encapsulation of cross-cutting concerns and feature traceability by design. That was the design purpose of the language and we have practical acceptance that is limited due to the fragile point cut problem. And people learned this the hard way because they started using aspect on the programming a lot and uh, then learned this uh, as maintenance issues arise over time. So you could think about what are actually the differences, the similarities of feature modules and aspects. I already talked about some of the similarities, but this would be something excellent as a practice for now to think about this and maybe make some notes on what is similar, what is different, and which features are particularly to benefit from the concept of quantification. So what features in the graph product line or another product line could you think of that would uh, benefit from aspect orientation and from quantification. Well, I was glad to have you here, uh, that you stayed until the end in this long video, in this long lecture, and hope to see you again next time when we uh, summarize all the different implementation techniques and when to use which of those. Thanks for being here and hope to see you again next time.